Well, we would like to welcome you to Divine Truth Christian Center where God wants your dreams and visions realized. On this particular evening, we're going to be talking about a wonderful topic that I think will surely bless you in a variety of ways. Um, it's something that I believe is essential to the believer. Why are y'all sitting in the back? Oh, okay. All right. Well, <laughs> like I said, welcome back, Miss Miss Weeks. I was gonna get a hologram and put it up there next Sunday if you weren't gonna be back. <laughs> Just like Tupac, you remember how Tupac said he's alive? They was gonna put a hologram up there. It's still, well, you know, I'm just saying. So once again, we'd like to welcome you to the sanctuary. Uh, we're back um, in the house of the Lord. Um, all the kids, I need you to take all of your devices and turn them off. Turn them off. All right. And so one of the things that I wanted to do as we go ahead and push forward in 2017, we have a lot of great things that are on the horizon as it relates to this ministry and as it relates to the word of God. Um, our influence is growing inside of the community. We're growing. One of the things that I um, definitely wanted to share is that um, we grew in significant ways last year. We almost grew by 40% as a congregation. It doesn't look like it, but it actually happened. And that is astounding for um, a church our size. And so we have nowhere else to go um, but up. So um, continue witnessing, continue reaching out to people, continuing, continue on loving God's people. Amen? Amen. And so as I get ready to get into the word for tonight, once again, the topic for this particular evening is going to be called Sound Doctrine. It's actually going to be a series. And a lot of these things you may know, but we want to bring deeper clarity to them. We're going to go over some words, some particular key words that you see inside of the scriptures and also in Christendom or theology as it relates to that. Now, one of the things that I will be doing um, on an ongoing basis in our Bible study is that when there are certain types of words, I want to give a definition of particular words that you may not um, always see in literature. Um, for example, Arminianism or Calvinism or you know, the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. I want to give specific definitions so that you'll know what these key terms are. Um, it's kind of like one of those things where sometimes you have a key word um, before you take a test and sometimes that helps you when it comes to um, getting through that test because you understand what the definition is, all right? So this particular evening's uh, scripture is gonna come out of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, and it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's the foundational piece. Now, just like you have sound doctrine, you also have, and I placed a counterverse. I'm teaching tonight. The counterverse to that is what is is what the people of God are fighting against right now. Hey, my sons need to sit up on the front row. That'll help quiet you down. Thank you. All right. So here's the counterverse to that. The first verse says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 through 5 in the NASB, it says, For the time will come when they people, church folk, the world in general, will not endure sound doctrine, you hear that word again, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves people on Facebook. They'll subscribe to individuals that do topical um, 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 things, but not really getting into the word. Okay. That's what that means. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, divine truth, you be sober and all things endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Amen. Everybody could do the work of an evangelist, which is nothing more than living your life out before men that would be in accordance to Jesus Christ. Amen. Something pleasing to God. Amen. Once again, the title of this evening's um, series kickoff is going to be called Sound Doctrine and Examination of the Christian Faith. Amen. 
So here's an outline, and here's a quick little outline. And like I said, feel free to ask questions, or if you do have a question, make sure that you write it down. And then we have, when we have our question and answer period, you save it, and then you can put it forth at that moment in time. Because I do not want the congregation that I pastor over to be plagued with ignorance. Don't be plagued. You can't be plagued with ignorance, especially since we're getting ready to have a new shift. Um, so an, an old preacher told me a long time ago, first there is the natural, then there is the spiritual. In the natural realm, we see a changing of kings. We saw one particular king did his particular exploits over the last eight years. Now we have a new king that may be doing his own specific exploits over the next four or eight years. It's a total tide shift. You've seen it happen overseas where you've heard of this thing called Brexit, or this is when a particular country's exited out of the European Union um, through this thing or through this rush called populism, which is a backlash against a lot of the political correctness and um, appeasement that has been going on across a lot of people in this world. So that's what's been going on in the outside. And so it touched over there in Europe first, then it hit the United States. That's why we have the president that we have that's going to be going through the inauguration in the next two weeks or so, all right? That person got elected by this thing that's called populism. In other words, we want to do something that is so totally different, so against the grain that we're breaking against the norm. So just like you see that in the natural world, God always uses those as signs of what is going on in the heavenly realm. And in the heavenly realm, there's also going to be a rush or breaking from the norm where things are going to be more transformative and it's going to be uh, definitely a life-changing situation. So some of the things we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks are the modern church. Number two, the first century setting. Number three, the need for doctrine. Number four, the development of doctrine. Number five, the inspiration of scripture. And number six, the major doctrine. Okay, once again, the modern church, what's going on with the body of Christ right now? What is God's um, um, view of the church? He believes the church is absolutely wonderful. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We can rail against the church and talk about the church is not doing what it's supposed to be doing, but that's talking about specific earthly ministries are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. But God's church is still pure and is still functioning as normal. Amen. The first century setting, what's going on with the first century church, how they went from small churches to large churches, how they went from a group of disciples in Jesus Christ walking around as a merry band of men that went through suffering and tests and trials and then expanded um, far beyond to almost two or three billion um, believers around the world today. From 12 to three billion, amen. The gospel is the anvil upon which all other forms of false doctrine and all other forms of attacks have been broken upon. You need to understand that well, Pastor was an anvil. An anvil is a piece of metal that you forge weapons on. And you take a hammer and you hit on it and then you're able to shape something on that particular anvil. So those of you that love cartoons, it's the thing that was dropped on Yosemite Sam's or <laughs> the Wile E. Coyote's head and it said Acme on the side. That's an anvil. Okay. Then we also talk about the need for doctrine. I want you to understand the word doctrine itself. Doctrine is not the same thing as religion. There are two different words. Religion is a system of beliefs and uh, understandings that's put into a package form and it expressed in a person's life. That's what a religion is. But a doctrine are specific tenets that make up that particular relig religion. For example, the doctrine of justification the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of redemption, the doctrine of hell, the doctrine of heaven, the doctrine of angelic beings. They're, all of those things are specific types of doctrines that are essential ingredients to what we call the Christian faith. 
then we'll be talking about the development of doctrine, how these things came about. Did they just pick a couple of words? Because, you know, sometimes when you have denominations like the Apostolic Reformation or the Baptist Reformation or the Presbyterians, you know, the laying on of hands like by the Presbytery or look at that, the methodology. So we have the Methodists. You see the Episcop Episcopalians or the Episcopacy. Um, you have the Latin Vulgate, all of these different types of things. Sometimes you would think that those are doctrines, but those are doctrines of men. There's a difference between a doctrine of men and something that Jesus specifically spoke of, or when they did go to the Nicene Creed, or when they did go to the uh, Council of Nicaea, they looked at the doctrine of hypostatic union, or the deity of Jesus Christ. They wrestled with that, and you know, Santa Claus, <laughs> well, I won't say Santa Claus, but old Saint Nick, or Saint Nicholas, which actually was a bishop that Santa Claus was based after, he actually was one of what I would call the fighting bishop that fought against a lot of other, there was this particular individual that was called Arius that was there at the Council of Nicaea that was trying to poke holes in the deity of Jesus Christ. And St. Nicholas was so irate with that till he went and actually started beating on Arius that told him that that is not right. I believe in Jesus Christ. He is fully God and fully man. Amen. So Santa Claus coming down the chimney is not the same as that particular Santa Claus. The Santa Claus back in the day liked to lay hands in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. And so they all came together and they wrestled over doctrine. It's important for you to understand that. So we look at the development, the inspiration, and major doctrines. All right. So the next piece that we'll look at is this. Once again, what is a doctrine? It is a belief or system of beliefs that make up a religion. It is a system of beliefs that make up a religion accepted by or accepted as authoritative by some group or school. Okay. So, once again, when you look at denominations or the way things are done. Now, here I'll give you one particular um, thing that's um, very, very familiar to you. You've seen it inside of some congregations where sometimes people start dancing and jigging and they always do the same movement. That's very familiar, isn't it? It's very practice, it's very religious. Well, did you know that that's called monatism? It was a, um, um, an Asian um, um, evangelist back in the um, early days of the church that when he prophesied, he would go into a trance almost as if he was demon-possessed and started doing a lot of the wild histrionics that you see in the charismatic churches today. And that particular tradition has carried on even today, but it is very devoid of the things of God. When you have sound doctrine, you know of things like that. Now, you don't need to just walk around saying, ah, that's a monasticist, or that, no, you don't need to know that, but it's just good for you to know what you believe and why. Next up, so once again, we see what doctrine is. Number two, what, who is it for? It's for the Christian church. Things that we affirm without question because they are so clearly stated in scripture, such as the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Why is that so essential? Why does that matter? Because if Jesus was not born of the Holy Spirit, then he's just a man. And if he's just a man, then we're still in our sins because no human can rise from the dead. And if he has not risen, then we are still condemned and there is no hope for us. So that's the reason why you've seen the archeological community and the community at large try so desperately to find where Jesus' bones really lie. Because if they can find those bones, then they could destroy 2,000 plus years of people being saved, delivered, and set free, and put forth that particular faith called Christianity as a, an astounding hoax, breaking hearts upon hearts. Amen. But thanks be to God that the Bible is true, or as the old preacher once again would say, holiness is right, and without holiness, you can't see God. Amen. Doctrine for the Christian church, and then also known as dogma. What is dogma? Not the movie, <laughs> but a dogma is called, or in other words, a dogma is a doctrine or code of beliefs 
accepted as authoritative. Now, you may have heard it inside of the secular world, a term called being dogmatic. I'm not talking about George Clinton and the atomic dog. Atomic dog, dogmatic, nasty dog. <laughs> you know, no, 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 that's, that's something totally different. Being dogmatic is almost like you being very restrictive and you adhering to specific principles. For example, let's say for example, you were trying to get into college and the admissions representative was being very dogmatic with you because you know they were saying, well, uh, sir, um, I understand that you have uh, a 2.98 GPA average, but you cannot start your classes unless you have a 3.0 average. But ma'am, inside of the um, student handbook, it says that you can make allowances for curving that up. And I've been going through this. No, 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 I'm just gonna stick with the rules. You ever met people like that where they said they're just not gonna bend any way at all because you know they're just being dogmatic. That's what happened with us when we were going to I think um, when the core team was going to the Orlando Magic thing and there was a lady that was there and she was being very dogmatic saying, nope, that child may be tall, but they're not passing the rules. She pulled out the ruler and everything and everybody's like, why are you, what is this? That's somebody who's being dogmatic. She had the authority, but sometimes you don't need to be so dogmatic because people will see you as being unbending and un or being very um, unforgiving with your approach. Okay. Unforgiving with your approach. So here's some key definitions. Once again, I want you to know what these words are. So when you see all these things on Facebook, or when you see Pastor Martin doing all of these hashtags, and when I say something, you'll know what they mean. So let's start off with the very first word. The very first word is called orthodox. Orthodox, for those of you online, it is spelled O-R-T-H-O-D-O-X in my Matt King Carter voice. Orthodox, orthodox. Orthodox means Adhering to what is commonly accepted. For example, an orthodox view of the world. Now, where does our ministry fall in line with this? Well, we are orthodox in our, um, in our doctrine. Very orthodox. You don't see Pastor Martin talk about some naming and claiming, blabbing and grabbing. That's not orthodox. So we're very orthodox in our beliefs. I'm very, very traditional when it comes to scripture and my view of scripture. When I preach, I use an expositional preaching style or expository preaching. In other words, I show you the verse and then I explain the verse line upon line and precept upon precept so there won't be any guessing at all. In the Old Testament, we know that it's in the Hebrew. So when I interpret a word, I do it from the Hebraic standpoint. And if it's from the New Testament, I do it from the Greek standpoint. So that you'll have the proper meaning. So that when you pray, or when you do a verse of scripture, or if you decide to get a tattoo on your leg, you put uh, the right one on there. <laughs> in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> oh, Lord. Next up, heresy. Heresy. Well, let me go back to orthodoxy. So orthodoxy basically means sticking with the traditional uh, pattern. I don't know where my Bible is. But sticking with the original pattern of Scripture as it is. The original pattern of Scripture as it is. Unbending, unmoving. The Word of God is the Word of God. I don't need to search outside of the Word of God as a, another higher source to explain what the Word of God is. It is paramount. It is what God has, it is God inspired, okay? So while this church is very orthodox, even though we have the lights, camera, and action, that part is charismatic or orthopraxy. You see that? Orthodox is adhering to what is commonly ex ex uh, accepted. Orthopraxy is adhering to a way of expressing your faith. So we are charismatic in our expression. Pastor Martin does believe in speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. Notice how I put on that ass piece. It's called glossolalia. Glossolalia. You'll, you could just talk to Google and it'll give you the right pronunciation. But glossolalia is the Greek word for speaking in tongues as the spirit gives utterance, not a lot of the gibberish that you hear. Like if you hear me tease and I say, e -ba -ba, 
a lot of times that's just me teasing, and that is not true glossolalia, or speaking in tongues. So I believe in that. I believe in the full counsel of the Lord. I believe in signs, miracles, and wonders. I believe that people can be risen from the dead. I believe that blinded eyes can be opened. I believe that ears can be unstopped. I believe in all of that because it's scriptural. I don't believe that the gifts have ceased. I believe that certain offices have ceased. But I don't believe that everything has ceased because God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. So we're charismatic. I believe in having instruments. I came from a church where it only had an organ and no drums. You had to have a dynamic choir back in the 80s and 90s because there were no other instruments allowed. That's the reason why. And so because people have been more charismatic in their expression and people be stop being as dogmatic, then you started seeing the choirs get it smaller and the instruments start to increase. Amen, somebody. Now we don't have choirs, we have chorales or praise teams. An elite group of warriors <laughs> going in. So, now now watch this. In the military, Donald Rumsfeld a couple of years ago said that he was going to contract the military to a more elite force because we no longer fight wars conventionally where you had to use a whole bunch of people in order to win over a particular country. Now you have SEAL Team 6. You have elite forces, the Rangers, the SEALs, the SEAL Team, the different types of Marines, the different types of groups that would go in there and would wreak havoc as if they were 100 or 200 men. It's not a new, it's not new because David did the same thing. So it is in the natural, it's also the same way in the spirit. So bigger isn't always better. All right. So what did we learn so far? Orthodox or orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Okay, we got that? All right. Next piece, heresy. Now this is something that you will not see at Publix. <laughs> You will not see this on the radio dial, but it is something that you need to be aware of. What is heresy? Heresy is a belief that rejects orthodox tenets of a religion. A heresy. So when you see on TV a preacher at 2 a.m. in the morning say, if you just send in $200.17 or $2,000.17, as a seed, or are we getting ready to come to the year of Jubilee and you need to put in a $50 seed to express your faith in giving and just put your name on it? No, they need to keep those TV shows going. If you just cut the TV show, then that'll save you a whole bunch of money. <laughs> Amen, Walls. Move to the internet. It's the new paradigm shift. You don't have to, you can save that money. Uh, you can save that money. You can save that money, but I digress. Heresy. So the ones that, the heresies, there's many heresies. That's why the Council of Nicaea had only 66 books inside of the Bible. The 66 books in the Bible were called the canon. Canon. It was called the canon. All right. So you had the Old Testament and New Testament. And they, so they put those groups of books together that affirm the life and deity of Jesus Christ, the expression of God and essential doctrines. When you look inside a Catholic Bible, you see more books. The book of Tobit, the book of Judas, um, the book of Thomas, other different types of books, the book of Enoch, part one and part two. A lot of those things have little elements of the truth, but they still were what we would call agnostic books. Agnostic books. In other words, they have a lot of heresies on the inside of them. And so that's the reason why the early church, the first century church that we talked about, that's the reason why they wrestled over the text. They didn't have an agenda. They didn't th see all of this today. They said that this man, Jesus, this person who saved us from our sins, has such an impact on us that we must be faithful to the scriptures and faithful to the text. And we cannot allow for the little foxes to nibble at the vine. You get that? It is the little foxes that nibble at the vine. Who is the true vine? Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll go even deeper with that. You might have seen me uh, put a uh, little encyclical on my Facebook page and inside of the DTCC group that was called um, The War of the Hypocrites. 
And in that particular encyclical or in that particular writing, I addressed the Kim Burrell situation because um, for whatever reason, while her delivery may have been rough around the edges and it was an old video, I believe some people were saying it was from seven years ago, it was so conveniently posted right before she went on that particular show. And so in my mind, I think that that was the best thing that ever happened to her because God stopped her from putting her compromise on display. She was already compromising all along with Whitney Houston and a couple of other people. So God stopped at home and, and allowed for the enemy to bite her hard because you can't hug the devil like that and not expect to pick up any fleas. That's the truth. So what was the essential part of that? Well, the essential part of that is, is that the main reason why Ellen DeGeneres or some of the other people were so harsh against her was not just really about her delivery, and it wasn't because they analyzed all of her sermons because she talked about a whole bunch of different stuff. It was just for the fact that there's a particular group who identifies themselves with a sexual activity that the Bible specifically speaks against. And so when you have other Christians say that that particular, or what is the doctrine? The doctrine is a doctrine of purity or sexual purity. That is a doctrine that you should not have sexual immorality. So when you have um, Christians that say that that's not really a doctrine and she was asserting what is scripturally true, then you have a bumping of heads, okay? And that's why you have a lot of compromising Christians that, watch this, notice the word heresy, a belief that rejects the orthodox tenets of a religion. So they reject that. And now the scripture comes alive of what I just was reading which was, I'll go back to the very beginning, which is this. Look at part two. For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled by Hollywood. They will accumulate for themselves other pastors that are compromising in principles or will tell you just had a great day today and you don't need to worry about negativity. And God is for you. You don't need to worry about people trying to hold you back. No, nobody's trying to hold you back. I don't get that. Sometimes when people are very insecure in their walk with God or they know that they've messed up, they believe that if a preacher sits them down or disciplines them or a person of God disciplines them, that they're being hold, held back purposefully. And so then that person will start, you know, throwing shade by saying, don't let anybody tell you that you can't do this and you can't do that. No, that is a, a prideful spirit. You need to repent. So you have to be careful of this. This will get you in a lot of trouble. But notice that this will happen. It will happen, but it doesn't have to happen to you or I. Okay. So we talked about heresy. One of the thing, words of the heresies that you know of that is so prevalent today is called, or there's two, there's prosperity gospel, which we know about that. That's the one that has done a lot of damage, and then word of faith. Prosperity gospel basically is a heresy that when an individual looks at scriptures like Deuteronomy 8, verse 18, where it talks about God gives you the power to get wealth, and you can speak those things that be not as though they are, you can't speak something in existence because you don't have that authority over the earth realm. You can only dominate over what God has given you. You can't dominate over his word because he's the only one who could say his word. You can only re repeat what he has already said. That's true prophecy. If you want to say, I'm a prophesy right now, I just read the scripture. We prophesy every single Sunday. I'm talking about not having a prophetic utterance to, to let somebody know what's getting ready to happen. That's a gift. But what I'm talking about, the true definition of prophecy means to state the scriptures, or in other words, repeat what God has already said. Because there is no new revelation. There is no new revelation. Well, what does that mean? What do you mean by there's no new revelation? There is nothing new um, that you could read in the scriptures that's going to surprise God. No new tenet. And so that's how cults are developed. That's why orthodoxy and specific doctrines are so important. So that if somebody does say, or Pastor Martin loses his mind one Sunday, and out of desperation he says, I need um, 10 ladies to stay over here. 
and I need another 10 men to sit over here. I need everybody to raise up their hand if they got $1,000 in their pocket right now. It's the year 2020. It's our 10-year anniversary, and I'm not paying for any of it. But if you do it, then you're going to be blessed and highly favored. Because the Bible says that God has given you the power to get wealth. Amen. But the scripture, when you read it, has nothing to do with that. It just lets you know that you should be grateful for having the ability to earn money. That's what it means. You see that? When you know that, then when you hear something foreign, you're going to be like, I'm good. <laughs> or if you do have to sit through service because your friend done invited you, on a, you know, to their church or while you're out of town, you could just sit there, but you could just discard everything. You could just start swatting it off and be like, mm -mm, that's, I know better than that. All righty. So those are the two known ones, but there's a lot of other ones. There's modelism, there's um, Arianism, there's a lot of other things. There's Pelagian, but I don't, don't want to get too deep in it. I just want you to know what it is, all right? Next piece, modern church uses, okay? Now, what this is right here, and I'll just start with number one. This is what you need to know. God cannot err, or God does not make no mistakes. No, God doesn't make mistakes. That's, that's basically what that means. Number two, the Bible is the word of God. Therefore, the Bible cannot be wrong. I make it plain. God is not wrong. Or put it this way. God is always right. The Bible is the word of God. Therefore, the Bible is always right. But pastor... I, was, I went into the lion's den, Elder Winston, I went on the lion's den last night um, in regards to the Kimberell um, situation, because I hate biblical ignorance. And so whenever I put a post out there, um, now I was advised by Bishop McLaughlin that you don't argue with unbelievers, so I didn't do it just for that purpose. But I put a post on the national website, and you know people were chiming in saying amen, amen, because those are the people I'm actually looking for. But then I had a couple of heretics and a couple of unbelievers that actually chimed in on those particular uh, tenets that I was adhering to. And so as a result of that, I was doing a back and forth with an agnostic, anti-theist. Not an atheist, an anti-theist. In other words, well, there was two people. There was an agnostic individual who affirmed no truth, and then there was an atheist on the other end who was an anti-theist. In other words, he just hated people who were from the church. One person said, Pastor, you're not a real Christian. <laughs> I didn't even dignify him with a response. I could have defended myself. I'd be like, man, you don't know me. You don't know me. You don't know, nothing. You don't know my church. I didn't know him whom I believe I was. The track record, I know that for myself. So the Bible says you don't argue with fools. That was an absolute slap monkey fool right there. So I didn't say anything to him. That's not insensitive because the Bible says that when it comes to one of the things that I have to, and I think it'll be good for you to discern the difference between is an individual who is a sinner versus an individual that is wicked. You got to know the difference between the two. I got a bunch of sinners on my wall that know the Lord, but they're not really ready to give their life to Christ just yet. They're out there doing their business. They're doing the seven sins. They're doing all the sins, but they have respect for the things of God. Just like I did. I was out there wine, women, and neck bones for a long time. But if somebody took me to church, I didn't act a monkey in church. Or if I did see a preacher, I did make sure that I didn't have cigarette smell or I did not have weed smell inside of my clothes. I at least tried to put some cologne on it when the person came around. Or if my parents took me to church, I made sure that I wasn't cussing as soon as I got to the parking lot. I waited at least I was a couple of miles away. You see that? That's, that's, that's sinner. But when you have somebody that's absolutely wicked, they're actually an enemy to God, and God will judge them harshly. So, you know, that's what I was dealing with last night. But the, the funny thing about it is, is that the individual was saying, well, you know, my, your post implies that you're just talking about one sin. I said, no, it's not. Because if there's anything that we need to learn as people of God is that we don't need to focus on just one sin only. Very important to do that. So I thought about it and I thought about it. I was like, how can I word this in such a way to where it hits everybody? And it hit everybody. 
And so the young man who was going back and forth with me, I said, prove it to me that I was talking about one specific sin. And he couldn't do it. He said, well, you implied. I said, yes. If we're all sinners, then that includes you too. Well, however, that, however you manifest that sin, it is what it is. And so we were just going back and forth. And sometimes I do that so that I test myself on how I handle those that are enemy to God or those that may be tough to witness to, but you're still witnessing to them regardless. Okay. You got to be able to do that. I do that every now and then. But for the most part, you don't need to go into an atheist group, talk about something. I believe in Jesus Christ. And you put down four or five scriptures, talk about, I believe God. Amen, wall. Amen, lies. Well, that's it. You're going to hell anyway. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Felicia. And you see a lot of that. And they say, oh, that's so Christian of you. I told the young man last night, I said, you are not a Christian. So you do not, you are not the foremost authority on what I believe. You don't know anything except for or having academic perspective of the scripture. You read a book and you studied it like a textbook, but you don't know how things are t knitly tied together and how the Old Testament and the New Testament, how the tabernacle is a similar type of Jesus. You don't know, understand all of that stuff. And I can't go there with you because that, that part is blind to you. So let's look at the other piece. Here we are referring to the original manuscripts written by the inspired writers. We do not have these manuscripts, but we do have reliable copies. Okay, let's just put this in plain speak. Can I get a Bible real quick? Just the old Bible, any Bible, all right. All right. You can't get it out? Wait. Oh, watch the drinks. I said, Lady Martin. You told me last night you had some muscles. <laughs> she got muscles all right. All right. So what this scripture is talking, what that, what that slide right there is talking about this. This Bible is not the original Dead Sea Scrolls that was found in Israel. It's not. Okay. But just because this is not the original, if I had the original copy, it probably worth several, several millions of dollars, and I probably had to do like this <laughs> on the way out of the church. But this is a copy of the original. Now, there's two things that you need to understand. There is a translation. There's, a, there's the difference between a translation and an interpretation. When an unbeliever says, or when an unbeliever, because see, that's typically how it's done. They, in order to weaken your doctrine, they try to go to the root, which is the word. If I can tear this down and show flaws in this, then I can show flaws in your, what you say is nothing more than an opinion, because this is a book of opinions. But you need to know the difference between a translation and an interpretation. There aren't many interpretations of the word of God. There are many translations. In other words, taking something from one particular language and then converting it into a language that we can understand. So one of the most reliable translations that you can have if you want to really get down to the brass tacks of scripture is the NASB Bible. Then comes the um, King James Version Bible, then comes the New King James Version Bible, then comes the other Bibles. The worst Bible that you can ever look at is the Message Bible, and then the NIV Bible. Those are the absolute two wor worst ones when it comes to word for word, absolute translation. You get that? But Pastor Martin, last night I saw Rod Parsley with the Rod Parsley Bible, or I saw a Bishop. McLaughlin Bible, or I saw a Pastor Martin Bible. These are just individuals that put their name on the front, but it's the same study Bible. <laughs> Y'all get that? That's not, those are just different translations, but it's not me coming up with this particular Bible and it's different from that particular Bible, no. The Greek and the Hebrew is the same that everybody translates from. So when you see this in the hotel room, <laughs> Okay, and you go to Genesis chapter one, verse one, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You should see it in all Bibles. 
You should see it in all Bibles. Now, if you saw it in the King James Version, it said, In the beginningeth, God createth the heaveneth and the earth-eth. That's Elizabethan English. But it's still, the message is still the same. Does that make sense? All right. It's not saying an interpretation is when you have a book and it's something like the atheist Bible. And what they would do is that they would look at the beginning and they'll say, that in the beginning, the universe exploded like a watch <laughs> that was thrown out of the universe and through a series of billions of years, it all came into order. When have you seen an explosion explode into perfect, uh, have you ever seen a car when it's crashed, it gets better? No. You can't. You can't take a watch that's been disassembled, put it inside of a box, close the box, and shake it as hard as you can, and come up with a perfect watch. That's what people think of when they think about the universe. So when you look at the Bible itself, that is the foremost authority. And you need to understand that there are not many interpretations. There are just many versions of the original copy. And it has never been lost in translation. <laughs> you need to know that only about 5% of the Bible, as we know it, has been mistranslated, 5%. And that's only because of certain missing words. But the, but the words that have been missing are certain sentences that cannot be interpreted because of the Dead Sea Scrolls or different types of things that were destroyed over time. It doesn't change the message. Quick example. Let's say, for example, I had an ancient document that said that one of my ancestors went from this part of America or from Florida to Georgia, and I wrote it down. Mr. Martin, born in 1881, started off in Jacksonville, Florida. He took a wagon, his family, and he traveled several hundred miles and ended up in Waycross, Georgia. You write that down, it is what it is. Now let's say, for example, part of that message got erased. And it just said that Andre Martin, born in 1881, went to Waycross, Georgia with his family. Has the message changed? Some of the details are missing. So when the Bible has been, when there's some inconsistency as it relates to the, a translation, it's talking about things like that. Does that make sense? All right. I wasn't going to get finished tonight. That's why it's a series. That's why we're going slow. We're eating this slow. We're chewing this slow. So once again, when you look at number two, that's the real issue in churches today. When we read Romans chapter 1, verse 26 through 28, and it talks about homosexuality. Regardless of how rough Kim Burrell spoke of it, it is still a hard verse to talk about to people who do not believe that that should even be in there. God says he was gonna love past that. He loves everybody. But I was thinking about it today, one of the other reasons why there is so much angst with that particular group is very rarely do you see a community that is identified by their sin. Look at over here, though, well no, it has happened before. When it comes to drugs, they would call all of the people who sold drugs dope boys. And so since everybody was called a dope boy, that right there was something that to some people was negative, but then they turned it into a positive. Let me get me a dope boy. They balling. They got the Louis Vuitton stuff that was back in my day, the MCM stuff. I'm really dating myself now. <laughs> With the gold emblem and the stuff, they had to match the match his shorts, said, let me get me a dope boy. But they really were the sorcerers of my modern times. So you do have a group of people that is identified by a specific sin that you've seen in the past. But well, that one is totally different. And so you see it today. And so. When you have an ancient book that's been around for 2,000 years and it totally goes against that particular group who's identified by that, then there's always going to be a bumping of heads. 
So much so until some of the people who are sitting in the pews, because you have people like that in your family, you'll want to compromise because you don't want to accept them. But you can't do that. You can have a gentle delivery, but you still need to be orthodox as it relates to the scriptures, all right? But we don't have, that's any sin. You don't need to have the, put it this way, Alcoholics Anonymous. Everybody there is alcoholic. Everybody there is drinking. But most people don't want to be known as an alcoholic, do they? Uh -uh. They don't wear that proudly. I'm an alcoholic and I have alcoholic pride. I have drug pride. I have gluttony pride. That was one of the ways they were trying to tear down Miss Burrell is because they said, that because they saw that she was overweight in one of her pictures, they said, well, she's just illustrating the sin of gluttony. That's how the world does. They, 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 they don't try to deny whether or not what you're saying is the truth, but because you're the messenger, they'll try to tear down the messenger to see what type of flaws are in the messenger. So that's why they hated Jesus so much. Because he was a perfect man. They couldn't find any flaws in him, and they hated him even more. You get that? All right. So that's the real issue today. No, it's just your matter of your interpretation. <laughs> it's not up to your interpretation, because all the Bibles say the same thing. Modern church issues, and this is where I'll close at for tonight. This is just a good beginning. If the Bible is the word of God, then the major doctrines and moral teachings are obvious. Number two, the crisis in the church today, right now, is that many do not believe the Bible is the word of God. They believe that it was written by men. And because it was written by men, and we know that men are not perfect, therefore the Bible is not perfect, and it is fallible. Get that word, fallible, F-A-L-L-I-B-L-E. Fallible means full of flaws. But if it's what God has said and God is always right, then you hear the opposite of that, which is infallible, without flaws. So just because everybody in your high school has a rainbow t-shirt, or just because um, certain things or certain groups could get you fired or certain things that you say could get you blocked out that doesn't mean that you need to try to change this amen one of the most sinister things I think about that entire situation is that she was recorded inside of her church so it was, she wasn't doing it at a government meeting they recorded her in church and then they played it so I guess Pastor Martin ain't going to Hollywood. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. But as a warning to both those of you that are in here that desire to be in biblical leadership, you can't fellowship with the devil and build your foundation off of the world. And then when you confront the world, they're going to yank the rug right up from under you. So one of the things that I'm happy about is that Mrs. Burrell built her foundation with the gospel and with the community inside of her ministry for several years or so. Her not appearing as a cameo next to Ellen is not going to hurt her at all. My spiritual father, Bishop McLaughlin, has been preaching hell is hot and you go in unless you get right with God for almost 30 years. And he's still very affluent because he's not trying to appease the world. He's trying to feed the people that God has given him. And they're not going to try to take him to jail for preaching exactly what they know to be true. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Oh, Christ, the solid rock I stand. So I'm going to do this. And God is my source, not Hollywood. Amen. Amen. All right. Next up, if the Bible is just another fallible book, you see that key word? Then one person's view is as good as any other. Tell me, a young man asked me last night, he said, um, 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 Pastor Andre L. Martin, just to tag, tell me who all wrote the Bible. Well, Moses, he wrote the first five books of the Bible. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You have a lot of the prophets. Some of them were unknown. Job could have been one of the writers of that particular text, but it is unknown. What are you getting at? Well, those are just mere men. And remember, I could just think of it. Well, if Moses was a killer and Paul used to throw people to Christians and they wrote stuff down 
and they were flawed, how can you believe what they say is true? But I always like to use this quick example, and this is where I start coming around the mountain, and it's this. If I'm in jail and I killed five people and I told you that what goes up must come down, it's true, and I wrote that down in the book. Even though I killed five people, is what I said still true? It's because the message is truth, even though the messenger is false or fallible aspect of God, which is he took fallible men as instruments to do his bidding, to do his will, to communicate, to express his word. So therefore, we are living instruments. That's it. I'm a flawed man. Let's just bring it home. I'm a flawed man in our last minute or so. You come on. I'm a flawed man. There's no doubt about that. My wife has seen my flaws. My children have seen my flaws. They see me with, <laughs> they, they said, Daddy, put your shirt back on. They seen my flaws. My wife has seen my flaws. My wife has seen me get mad, seen me get upset. My kids definitely see me act a barbarian at the house. Some of y'all, if y'all been with me very close, you see me get a little rough around the edges. You heard me say some things. But I do not take the flaws that I have and try to amplify or justify them through the text. You have to be able to separate the two. And I don't preach, as my spiritual father would say, what I don't practice. Amen. Not the other way around, which is practice what you preach. No. Don't preach <laughs> what you don't practice. Don't preach what you don't practice. So, last but not least, if the Bible is merely a human book, the doctrine is meaningless. Doctrine of justification. If it's merely a pen, an opinion of people that lived 2,000 years ago, then why can't... I, I, I was amazed at the number of people who were um, subscribed to this one particular page on Facebook. I think it's... I ain't going to give you the name because both y'all, some of y'all going to look it up. But there's this one particular celebrity gossip person that kept on posting articles about how Ms. Burrell is homophobic. Do you know what a phobia is? It is an irrational fear of something. How many of you are irrationally fearful of people who have an alternative lifestyle? I'm not. No, but when you use that word, it has a, such a heavy connotation to it, to the point to where people are like, forget it, I'm just not gonna say anything then because I don't want to be slaughtered in the public eye that way. But the truth of the matter is, is that that entire situation teaches us a lot of things that you can't compromise. You can't be that Christian that's trying to be cool with everybody. Well, you know, I was a sinner just like you. Let me go ahead and get that weed. Let me go ahead and hit it up. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I won't, don't worry, I'm not gonna get high from it. I'm not gonna get high from it. And I'm in the neighborhood with you trying to witness about Jesus, and I'm taking a hit with you. All right? You can't do that. And so in many aspects, she got a little taste of the world, and she saw her celebrity grow, and then they turned their back on her when she started turning to the word. You can't do that. Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. That is the truth of the matter. Okay? All right. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Yes, go ahead. Uh, when you talk about certain officers, mm -hmm. and Steve, what are you talking about? What do you mean by that? Um, basically, what I mean by certain officers that have been ceased, I believe that, as Paul says, the Bible says that I have given you some prophets, some apostles, some pastors, some teachers, some evangelists, for the work of the ministry, for the education for the people of the, or for the body or the education of the saints. Well, when it comes to apostles, regardless of what you see on the flyers, regardless of what you see out there on posters and things like that, the truth is is that there's two types of apostles. A lot of people don't know this. The first type is the apostles of Jesus Christ, the ones who actually saw him face to face, the twelve including Judas. 
that's why they called him an apostle even at, at the time, or you know, even though he f was one example of an individual who Jesus chose, but he was still not saved. So there are no apostles today in this earth realm right now that saw Jesus. Zero. All of the true 12 have died and gone on to glory, except for one. That's it. Well, what about Paul? Paul didn't see Jesus face to face. Paul saw a Christophany. He saw Jesus' glorified body. And that qualified him. Does that make sense? So that classification of an apostle is ceased. It's locked. It's canonized. It's not going to be any additions to it. I don't care how many people attach that to their names. It's not what it is. Now, what I also believe is that there is a type of apostle that is present today. But it is after the tradition of Barnabas, which was not an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was an apostle of Paul. He was Paul's understudy. And they eventually separated and went, there and uh, went their separate ways. And Paul established churches and Barnabas established churches too. Some of which ended up in Egypt and other places like that. So that type of an apostle is not the same classification as one of the 12. The 12 have ceased. And upon this, the foundation of the apostles and the prophets are all of what Jesus Christ has built his uh, covenant upon, the law and the prophets. That's what that's talking about. But, and then, so that, excuse me, that's the apostles, I'm sorry. So when it talks about the apostles, talk about the 12, minus Judas and Paul. But Barnabas, you'll see in the scripture, it's text, I don't remember the verse, but it talks about the apostle Barnabas and the apostle Paul. Now, Barnabas didn't see Jesus, but the scripture calls him an apostle. But what type? He was an apostle of Paul. That type of apostle is what you would call a missionary. That is a missionary. So if you see, if you wanted to change what it is, you know what should be on the flyers today? Apostle um, Bubby Williams is coming to your city. <laughs> Doors open at 7 p.m. It's free admission so that I could get you later. <laughs> Lord have mercy. So that type of apostle, what should be on the flyer, is missionary Bubba Williams is coming to your city. Like the same type of missionaries that went over to Africa, to Asia, that went and planted churches. That is what you call a governing apostle or an apostle of the church governmental structure. So when Bishop McLaughlin and my wife and I met, he was the apostolic authority over this church, and under his uh, tutelage, we planted a church here in the Central Florida area. We're basically, really, my wife and I, we're basically missionaries. But we don't call ourselves Apostle Martin and Apostle Lady Martin. Because I'm not a missionary in the sense, not as manifested right now. And let me go deeper. There are no women apostles. Nowhere in the scripture will you find one. Ooh. It's, it's not in the word. And a lot of women are finding that out. So they put prophetess so-and-so. That is biblical. And it's just as powerful. I'm just saying. <laughs> so that is what it means by what has ceased. The 12 has ceased, but the missionaries still go forward because it goes with the Great Commission, which is to preach the gospel to every living creature all around the world. That is our mission statement. And as a missionary, apostolic, also known as apostolic, I'm going to go and I'm going to plant a church in Castleberry, Florida, or Winter Park, or Maitland, Florida. I'm going to plant a church in Cameroon, the country of Cameroon in Africa. That's what that means. But it does not carry any other spe special or significant weight to it. That's it. It's just a church plan. They set up the church and they keep it moving. 
That's it. That's why you don't see any mega churches with apostles at the top of the. You don't see mega churches with apostles, and you don't see mega churches with prophets. One of them keeps it moving. The other one prunes the church. Are there any other questions? Now, see, I'm not going to be invited to Ellen's show, and I'm not going to be invited to other pastor's shows, neither. <laughs> but we're orthodox, and you need to know the truth. Are there any other questions? Y'all got me now. Y'all got the preacher. I'm not going to shout you down if you ask me a question. Yes, go ahead. Ask for everybody else, because I feel that stomach rolling over. Talk about some feed me, Seymour. Feed me. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, what can you tell to somebody who believes in God and they believe in Jesus, who believe you? Uh, okay. What can you, oh. What can you tell someone who believes in God but doesn't believe everything that the Bible says? I mean, what can you tell them? Like, they try to come to church, they pray for their families, you know, they believe that Jesus died for them, but they don't believe everything that's in the Bible. Like, what can you tell them? There's other ways to God. Um, that is what a lot of people believe that. You know. Um, Tiffany, what's your oldest daughter's name? Nyla. A lot of your classmates and I probably believe, and a lot of other people who were born in the 80s and 90s and things like that, also don't have a problem with Jesus. They just don't believe it's the only way to God. You know. But there's a lot of people who believe that. But we have to go back to what the truth is. And this is where we just talk about logic. Can you have something that is true and not true at the same time. No, just anybody. Can you have something that is true and false at the same time? The answer is no. You know what that's called? The law of non-contradiction. The law of non-contradiction states that something can't be true and false at the same time. So you can't have many ways to God if Jesus said that I am the way the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. So either this is wrong or the person is wrong. You can have somebody who's sincere but be sincerely wrong. So what I would say to that person is, what is your definition of truth? What is truth? That's usually when I start with people who have a lot of people who believe in um, relativism, which is there's no right and wrong. Don Lemon, I'll give you a quick example of that. Don Lemon, I'm, so I'm sure some of you have, might have heard or saw on CNN today about um, a group of four young um, children of color um, that was beating and torturing a disabled Caucasian gentleman and posted it on Facebook and made him say, uh, expletive Donald Trump, expletive white people, and they were streaming it live as if no one else was going to see it. And now their lives are gone, especially in this culture. Now that that man is getting ready to come in office, you can forget it. So those individuals that did that and committed that particular um, atrocity, Don Lemon said, I don't think what they did was evil. Wait, a cotton-picking minute. In my Andre Senior voice, wait, a cotton-picking minute. Are you, do you mean to tell me that you actually said out of your mouth that that is not really evil and you just need to understand? But that in and of itself is endemic of the culture that we live in, which is some of the seeds of what your friend is dealing with, which is there is no really no right or wrong. It just depends on what your perspective is. It just depends what your opinion is. What's for you is not necessarily for me. What you do at your house is not necessarily what I do at my house. What you do with your man is not the same thing I do with my man. 
<laughs> so you see that type of thinking? And then they try to bring that secular thinking into the house of the Lord. Well, I know what your pastor said, but Dr. Umar said this. So when you talk with somebody like that, you have to get right down to the root of their belief system or the worldview, which is what do you believe truth is? Truth is what you make it. That's a dangerous place to be. And you talk about that. You just go with logic and you pray for them. But you, so before you get into all the biblical stuff, you need to sign and ask them, can you believe that something can be true and false at the same time? So your friend has a problem with what the truth really means. They believe in subjective truth, not objective truth. Subjective truth is like moving goalposts. Okay. Anybody got a piece of paper? Okay. All right. I'll take my son's piece of paper. Y'all remember this one back in the day? <laughs> this is what you would call a football. <laughs> Y'all remember that? This is real old school right there. And you would just slide it across the table. You slide it across the table, and that thing would be just like right on the edge, and you scored. I was a champion in that. <laughs> well, come on, Andre, come up here for a second. This is, my arms represent truth. This represents um, how you feel about the truth. Okay, hold this and stand it. I'll do it this way. So my arms represent the goal pose. Now, no, don't do it for real. Just what you do, <laughs> hit me right into my head. What you're gonna do is you're just gonna take this and simulate it going through the goal pose, right? But don't let go of it. So you're gonna do like this and then come back. All right, you got it? So this is absolute truth. Here are the goal posts. Um, and it says that the truth is that Jesus is the only way to God. The person who believes that agrees because they go through and they affirm that. But a person who believes, that's objective truth. The goalposts are fixed. But somebody who believes in subjective truth says, uh, I don't really believe that Jesus is the only way to God. Go ahead and take that and kick it off. Yes, try to do it. Moving goal posts. You get that? So that means that the truth is all over the place. It just depends on your perspective. But something can't be true and move all over the place. It has to be firm, fixed, unmovable, unchanging, the same today, yesterday, and forever. Does that make sense? So that's where I start with. And a lot of people have a lot of trouble when I attack their roots of their worldview. I don't even deal with the religion. I say, what is truth first? Amen. All right, are there any other questions? Y'all pressing me. Y'all squeezing out the anointing. I got a little bit left. Anything else? Go ahead, oh, Brother Torrell. Praying Yahweh's name versus Jesus' name. Now, let me dig a little bit deeper. Are these people who, um, are these Jehovah Witnesses? No. Are they Hebrew Israelites? So they might be adhering to Hebrew Israelite doctrine. Well, Here's the thing. Let's see the best way I could put it this way. Names denote ownership. So I would ask that individual, who owns God? God says, God, you will never, you will not find anywhere in scripture where God gave or, or said what his name was. He said, I am that I am. No one owns me. 
Names are for things that are owned. Yahweh is a title. It's an office. It's not a name. So literally what they're saying, I'm doing this in the office of the Lord's name. But God specifically said Jesus because that is his only begotten son. That's an extension of himself as a man in the earth realm so that we could have a bridge. So when you do think now, the real translation for Jesus in the Jewish, well, some people believe it's Isios. That's one particular translation, but on, and that's I-S-E-O-U-S. And then the other type is Yeshua. That's the Hebrew aspect of it. So if they want to be accurate, they say in Yeshua's name. Every now and then I do that. I say it in Yeshua's name. But when I talk about Yahweh, when you look at the definition of what Yahweh means, it means salvation. Salvation of the Lord. That's, that's what it means. It's not, that's not what God's name is. That's correct. In Jesus' name. Because Jesus is nothing more than an English translation of Yeshua. But Pastor Martin, you don't understand the letter J was not invented until the year 14 something or something, something, something. So therefore, since the letter J is a new construct, Jesus never existed. But Yeshua always has. Don't read the Bible from an American perspective. So that's what it means. So when they say in Yahweh's name, they're basically saying in God's name. But God is not the name of God, is it? What is, what is God's name? I am that I am. Do, do you understand the gravity of I am? I am. That's self-existent, self-perpetuating, uncreated creator, the kickoff of everything. Yes. <laughs> he, is the, he is the original jump off. So his office, when he declared to Moses, here's the scripture to back it up, when Moses was like, who is this? Who are you? He didn't say Yahweh. He didn't say Yeshua. He said, I am that I am. And Jesus said, I am that I am too. When all of the uh, Roman soldiers came up to the point to where they tried to take Jesus and one of the disciples cut off one of the Roman soldiers' ear, he put the ear back on the man. But then when Jesus spoke, all of the Roman soldiers felt dead when he said, I am. Oh, that got me too. Lord Jesus. Al, that got me too. Oh, God. They fell as dead. And so he rose them up because you can't stand before God as sinful people. So they fell dead. So he had to contain himself just for that moment. Oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, that got me too. So that's the answer to the question. God. I got into a debate with a Hebrew Israelite, and I said, you don't know what the name of God is. You won't find it nowhere in the Hebrew text. Not at all. All right. <laughs> Yahweh actually centers around the Tetragrammaton, or the, the Old Testament trinity. It's called the Tetragrammaton, but you don't even have to get on all that. I am that I am. That's how God describes himself. So when they use those Yeshua's name. Yeah. Those of you that are online, that's what I mean. <laughs> All right. Are there any other questions? Tiffany, you got a question? I know that. <laughs> 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 I do a lot of reading. I do a lot of studying. I, um, here's a, on a serious note, your pastor used to be in, before I got saved, I was a Mason at the age of 19. And I was into a lot of the occult things and a lot of uh, different types of levels. And I went up very high as a young man back at that moment in time. And um, I love esoteric, which uh, the word esoteric means little known or hidden knowledge. I was very much into those types of things. I was going all over the city, going through all different types of rituals. It was just crazy when I was in um, college. I was a part of different types of cults and organizations and all this other stuff because I was on the search for truth. I knew that there was a God, but I, like your friend, believed that there was many paths or many options. 
or many entrances to the supermarket. But then, after meeting my, my wife, my wife took me to church at her my father's uh, church, and I was like, oh my goodness, I got a church girl. How can I conduct myself? <laughs> <laughs> and I was still a heathen, I didn't care. Then she took me to church, but then right before, so basically, in a nutshell, I was the agnostic. I knew that there was a God, and I knew that Jesus was real, but he wasn't real to me. Okay, so I met Lady Martin, and right before we got married, she said, I don't know what you're gonna do with all of your hats and aprons and books and stuff like that in that briefcase that you take out in the dark of night. <laughs> I was into it like really heavy, man. I found one of my pictures, I'll show it to one of y'all like one of these days in the future. But I went to all that stuff, paid all the money, the whole nine yards, everything. And she said, you have to make a choice because I don't know all about that stuff, but um, you're gonna have to choose that or me. You have to understand, I became one when I was 19. But then when I met her, I was like 22 years old. So that's 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. I said, I knew them longer than I knew you. I said that. I said that. But she was like, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. And I was pacing. I was like, man, and stuff like that. And I was trying to find out how I could go higher. But somehow, some way, and this is something that she doesn't even know, I went to the gentleman that could take me higher and somehow, some way, I couldn't, he never answered the door. He never answered the door, he wouldn't come to the door and when I asked him about it, he said, well, we don't really do that elevation here, you gotta go somewhere else to do it, out of town. I was like, I'm broke. Y'all took all my money, I ain't have no more money. So I was teed off at that. So I figured, well, I'm getting ready to graduate and all this other stuff and, you know, these cults like Malachi Z. York and all of these other different types of things, these are not real. And the, you know, the black ball that I got from Spencer's that's, that I used to shake up every time I thought a girl was pregnant, I said, is she pregnant? Yes, no, or maybe, and I, was, I kept on shaking until I got the result that I wanted. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't work. I'm just being real with you. And so it all came to a head and I had to make a choice between that and Lady Martin. I chose Lady Mark, and I believe I made a wonderful choice. All right? All right. But no, a lot of that stuff comes through prayer. It's a gift that I have to be able to see things in the scriptures, and it's an awful lot of study. An awful lot of study. All right? Any other questions? Anything else? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Let me put my glasses on for this. Something when you pointed her out about, you know, knowledge, sometimes your friends probably don't believe in this. I think she has this misconception that it's not as important as it seems riding with God in your heart and not the actual baptism. So this in some kind of way, I'm gonna be on both of y'all's side. <laughs> so this is how King Solomon didn't divide the baby in half. <laughs> so and my answer no, no, it's fine. So the answer that I give is not going to be on your side or her side. Okay, is that fair? That's fair. <laughs> See, my old age and my hairline is good for something. All right. So here's what the Bible says, not what I think. Um, the Bible says that there's only two things, and it's, you'll see it in the Romans row. I posted it up a little bit later on. But in the Romans row, it talks about in Romans chapter 9, verse 9 and 10, it talks about if you believe in the Lord Jesus, that he rose from the dead, and if you believe in the Lord Jesus and that he rose from the dead, you will be saved. That's it. If you believe in your heart that Jesus rose from the dead, then you're saved. So if you believe 
and repent. That's all you need to have in order to be saved. So, that's part A. That's the inward cleansing. But being baptized, there's no law against that. That's an outward cleansing. So the outward baptism is a sign to the unbelievers and to other individuals on the outside world that you have dedicated yourself to Jesus Christ. But is it absolutely necessary to be saved? No, it's, it's more of an Old Testament ritual. That's why Jesus said to the Pharisees who also went down with John. Remember, John was baptized in the water. There's one that baptized you with water, but there's one coming after me that will baptize you with water and fire. So what I'm saying is, is that you can be saved without baptism, but somebody who is saved will want to be baptized. Y'all saw how I did that? You see how I did that? So it's both and, not either or. In America, we like to say it's either or. You have to be baptized or else. Or you have to be saved from your heart or else. But somebody who wants to be saved will have no problem with being baptized. Because they want, watch this, the whole world to know that they are a child of God. Amen. You see how I didn't divide that baby? I only cut off a fingernail. <laughs> Father, thank you for this time. We worship you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and get a seed in your hand. And that's it. That's particular evening. All right. So if you like that particular teaching, um, that's kind of like the theme of the way we're going to do things throughout the year. A nice question and answer. Bring your questions. If you got a friend that's always trying to debate the Bible, bring them here too. They get two questions. All right. All right. Be blessed.